Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast. Robert Glasscock and Thomas Miller, a couple of old riders back in the saddle again. And today we're going to continue our series on the axis points in the chart. We started with the third and the ninth. We've also done the first and the seventh, the second and the eighth. So today we're going to move to the fourth and the tenth. And all of these are important, but especially if you're in your work and raising kids years, this one is especially relevant to you. Robert? All right. These are two of the primary houses of the horoscope. One of them, the fourth house, represents the foundations of your life. It's like the foundation of a house. Is it solid? Is it on shaky ground? The 10th house is the house of culmination in your life. The 4th house is a private house. The 10th house is a public and collective house. They're the same thing, except for that distinction, private and collective. So that the 10th house becomes the foundation, if you will, of your public life, your career, and so on. The 4th house represents both endings and beginnings. So as, for example, transiting Saturn moves through your fourth house, it tends to indicate very literally endings and beginnings in terms of your foundation, your security. The fourth house is where we go for security, inwardly and outwardly. And the sign on the cusp will tell you a great deal about where you find your version of security. The natural sign for the fourth cusp, the fourth house, is cancer, a water sign, an emotional sign of home and family. But what if you have Aries on the fourth cusp? That's not about home and family. That's about you as an individual. Aries is a sign of action and change and dynamic. That's where you, if you have Aries on the fourth cusp, will find security is in constant change. It can be Aries on that cusp. This is just an example. It can be or seem to be very selfish. Or it may be someone whose life this time around is meant to find security in their own personal identity and their own personal ambitions and in change. So Aries on the fourth cusp may find perversely, it seems, security in change rather than the natural sign there, which is to find security in a family, people that you love, that you live with, that you belong to, and you share things with. Aries is not about that. So it's fascinating to examine the sign on your fourth cusp and the planet that rules it and the aspects that that planet makes to achieve an understanding of your own definition of what brings you security and where your roots are. Aries on the fourth cusp, for example, may be indicative of someone who needs to get away from their family to find their identity. Conversely, The 10th house is the culmination house. It's meant, it is a public house, like all the houses above the horizon line, the ascended, descended. So the 10th house becomes, this is what I want to show the world professionally or in terms of my ego, my public identity, my collective identity. And that's symbolized up at the 10th house. So those are the primary indicators of this axis, which is crucial in astrology. Also in natal astrology, the fourth house represents the parent of final recourse. Usually this is the father because you, the 10th house contrast rules the mother. She is the parent of quote unquote, immediate resource recourse rather. So in a typical classical family situation. The mother is the day-to-day authority. She's the one that sends the kids off to school, and she's there when the kids come home from school. Things are changed from that old classic stereotypical definition today, but nonetheless, the phrase, I'll tell your father when he gets home, 
that reflects this notion of the parent of immediate recourse in contrast to the parent of final recourse, whichever parent that is, is ruled by the fourth house. So the tenth house has a lot to do with looking at your relationship to your mother at the tenth house and to your father at the fourth house. So those are two other definitions. But this axis, which of course squares the ascendant descendant axis, and it's meant to, it's a developmental square. When you marry, that's a first and seventh aspect. Typically with marriage, you leave the home and parents and cleave to your partner. And that's meant to be a developmental square. Hard aspects are actions, and they the squares are, the hard aspects, period, are developmental. The soft aspects, trines and sextiles, are more states of being and preserve the status quo, in a sense. So that the fourth, tenth axis, then, becomes really a matter of, through astrology, helping you identify your personal, individual roots in this life. You may have a sign like Sagittarius on the fourth cusp, a sign of travel, which sometimes will indicate a life where you will move a long distance away from your home and family to find yourself and find your life. It can also mean internal travel through education, for example, or mental travel, as in the case of an astrophysicist, for example, who spends her or his life mentally, intellectually exploring the cosmos. That's another internal form of travel. You have a sign like Taurus on the fourth house. There, the security will absolutely, the foundation will be materialistic. They really want to have a physical, stable, reliable home and property and family. A place, that's what brings them security. And contrast that with, say, Aries or Sag on the fourth. Then when you look to the opposite house, the tenth house, that's meant to take you from your foundations and apply that into the public sphere. This is what I want to do for a living. This is what I want to be in terms of my career and my ambitions. This is what I want to show to the world, the collective, whether it's just a local town or the state or the nation. This is where I want to excel. So the 10th house really becomes the culmination point of what starts in the fourth house. And every time a major planet transits through the fourth house, especially the outer planets, but even Mars or Jupiter or Mercury, every time a planet transits through the fourth house, you should be conscious of a, an ending and beginning cycle in relationship to what that planet means on its own, as well as the house matters that that planet rules in your natal chart. And then the same token applies to planets transiting through the 10th house, because that's a culmination house. It brings a culmination to the matters that are ruled by the planet transiting through that house and to the house matters that that planet rules. So that's a beginning of a way to look at these, this axis, this fourth, tenth, tenth axis, which is so important because it does rule you the very foundations of your soul in this life. And if you can understand that and the planet that rules that fourth house and the aspects that planet makes, you'll go a long way to actualizing what you're here to do. Wow. Great description. That's awesome. I wanted to spend a little more time here on this episode because we crossed now to the first time that we have a square. <laughs> We've talked about the first. We haven't gotten to the, well, we talked about the first seventh. So now, as you mentioned, the fourth and the tenth, the angular houses all square each other. And they're also the emphasis point in the chart. I mean, they're angular. They are the most amplified houses of the other structures. What significance is that, that these key points are all square to each other? 
Okay, once again, the squares, any hard aspect, really, but let's just say squares and oppositions, are inherently in conflict, and they're meant to be, because conflict and frustration are things that motivate us to change and grow and develop. The soft aspects, the triumphs and sexiles, and to an extent the conjunctions as well, are aspects of states of being. When everything, even if you're in a rut that's a negative rut, it can still feel safe and comfortable, and there's no motive to change anything with soft aspects. With square aspects or oppositions and conflict, there is a motivation to change because something is frustrating you. And the frustration is meant to cause you to think and take action to resolve the perceived conflict. So those hard aspects that have such a negative reputation in astrology are really aspects about development. If, if we didn't have conflicts, you know, if you're, if you're a writer, you know this. Drama is conflict, so is comedy. So it's it's a natural part of life to have these hard aspects and these stress aspects and squares and oppositions and so on. They're very much developmental and they are meant to do that. Motivate you to think about why am I feeling frustrated? How how can I resolve the frustration? A lot of times it's simply a matter of communications, communicating what your frustration is with yourself first. What am I frustrated over? Do I have habits that are holding me back that I need to change? Do you have a habit that's driving me crazy that we need to talk about? And so on. So whether it's with a wife or a husband or an employer or a coworker or a friend, communications are a, a major aspect of growth and development and constructive change, building bridges through communications. And a lot of people never learn how to do that. And they feel alone and they feel powerless. They may give their power to other people, but it's through thought and and introspection really and looking at where am I feeling frustrated? What's blocking me? And what can I do about that that's constructive? And through that process, you can begin to resolve those squares and move on. But they're absolutely developmental. The first house is you. The seventh house is other people, especially maybe one other person in a partnership with you, whether it's through marriage or business or even very close friends. The type of friends that we have in the 11th house are different from our very closest friends. Most of us have very few close friends, truly people that you can call at two in the morning who will be there for you. And that friend is ruled in the seventh house, not the 11th. Because anyone, and this is why this seventh house rules open enemies, Thomas, as opposed to hidden enemies in the 12th, open enemies have equal power to you, even though they're a threat, just like a spouse has equal, you treat a spouse equal to yourself, or you should. So anyone, any relationship in your life that is to you equal in strength to yourself is shown in the seventh. More social friends, the usual classification of friends, is shown at the 11th, but that's a different relationship than the first seventh and then the the fourth tenth axis are people that really are part of our family both at home every day and also in our our work environment show you where my mind goes as you were talking about traditional mom and dad being ruled in the respective houses say the fourth for father and the tenth for mother in traditional setting i thought well that's the couple, they're married, they've had kids, half the marriages end in divorce, (laughs) they're in opposition to each other, so you either have to figure that opposition out or you end up getting divorced. It's like half the marriages don't figure it out. True, true. And for some of us, you know, it's just inconceivable that we would spend our entire lives being married to one other person. 
and yet to other people, that's exactly what they do. Well, that's it. Once you figure it out, you can't pull them apart, right? They figured it out, and they're not, they're inseparable at that point. And, they and, really and become predict- one. And for different people, different modes of living are, are appropriate, really, and are constructive. Uh, I just read for a client uh, yesterday, in fact, has an incredible marriage. Yeah. And very rare. It's very rare. All right. You but mentioned in- you mentioned that the fourth house is private and the tenth house is public. Yeah. So if we go back to the other angular aspect of the first and the seventh, do they have a public-private component as well? Well, the, the the first house is essentially a private house. You can divide the horoscope into halves and quarters. So anything above the horizon, above the ascended, descended horizon is in the public sphere. Anything below the ascended, descended horizon is in the private sphere. And divide the, the hemispheres of the chart. So the left half of the chart is the more private and personal side of the horoscope. The right hemisphere of the chart is more outward and public. So you can absolutely, the most, in other words, the most personal quadrant of the horoscope is the first, second, and third houses, the first quadrant, because they're in, they're below the horizon and to the left side of the hemisphere. So those are the three most personal houses. Then you get into the fourth house and the fifth and the sixth. They're also personal houses because they're below the horizon. But they involve other people, unlike the first, second, and third, necessarily. And if you just think about being born and developed, you know, you're born into a physical body at the first, and the first thing you do is acquaint yourself with your senses. You hear things, you feel things, you sense things, you can reach out and touch things. So you've got a physical body at the second house. The third house is your senses of audio, visual senses, and your hands and limbs and so on, and your mind. And then you become aware of, oh, I've got, I've got, a family. This is a house. This is these are brothers and sisters. These are parents. And then you start preschool or kindergarten. Oh, these are my little friends. This is school. This is educate. Now you're beginning to get out of the home at the fourth and into the fifth, and so on. So if you can think of those quadrants of the horoscope, you can get a notion of which are the so the first house is a very personal house. The seventh house is it, the other. In just a, in a broad sense, really, the first seventh axis shows you how you think of yourself and how you perceive the world. So if you're born with Jupiter in the seventh, you're going to perceive the other in a Jupiterian way. If you have Saturn in the seventh, you're going to view the world and everybody in it as Saturnian to start. You can learn and grow. But so the first seventh represents I And the seventh house represents thou in the Martin Buber construct of that. I, thou. So that seventh house is absolutely a public house as opposed to the first house below the horizon, personal. Does that make any sense? I love that. I think that's great. In fact, I put in my notes, and we may come back and revisit this, to do the whole chart on these personal and public. That's a fascinating study in and of itself. Thank you so much for this. I'm loving this series. Are you guys enjoying this as well? The next one we will do is one that I'm going to be sitting not able to sleep at night because it's going to be the 5th and the 11th. And, of course, I've got a... (laughs) pocket full of planets in the fifth. So I'll be interested in hearing what Robert has to say about that. Thank you so much for listening to us today. We've got all the things that you need to keep up with what we're doing around here in the show notes, including the link to Robert to get a hold of him for a reading. And we will see you back on the next episode on the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology podcast with Robert Glasscock.